Hello and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. So Joe, clearly a lot still going on uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But one of the big talking points in the past couple of weeks has been this idea of a retaliatory response from Russia, not necessarily in the sense of um, traditional warfare, but in the form of cyber warfare. Right. So this has always been a source of concern going back for several years, long before the existing conflict. What are Russia's cyber warfare capabilities? How weak is the rest of the world? How exposed is critical infrastructure and so forth? As of now, you know, I don't think this has been a huge aspect of the current conflict. Traditional Mm -hmm. uh, violent warfare has sort of been the story but it is uh, always lurking out there as a risk. Yeah, there have been some rumblings of potential attacks. I saw something in um, Der Spiegel this morning about possibly a a hack of um, satellites that might have been impacting Ukraine. So there are sort of rumblings of this, uh, you know, some accusations lurking in the background, but we haven't seen anything. Let's say we haven't seen anything major yet. And I feel like cyber security risks, it's one of those things that you you always see people mention as a sort of left tail risk. You see lots of analyst yeah. notes about it, but no one really talks about it in concrete terms. It always seems right. to be just this vague threat lurking in the background. Yes. And I think it's in part because, as you exactly say, no one precisely knows what it would look like. Um, Mm. I mean, obviously, companies are regularly getting hacked. We've seen an increase over the years in uh, malware and ransomware and companies losing data, companies having to pay to bring factories and infrastructure back online. Of course, I think it was uh, late 2020 or maybe early last year, there was that pipeline on the central part of the United States. So these things uh, recur, but I think it's very nebulous what that risk actually looks like. So today, I'm very pleased to say we are going to try to get a firmer handle on what cyber warfare risk might actually look like. And uh, we're going to do it maybe a little bit differently um, to what we normally do. But today on the show, we're going to be talking to a hacker about what it actually means to, you know, do cyber warfare, to hack into someone's systems, uh, what the threat actually looks like and what is possible from a technological perspective. I'm really looking forward to this, sort of different from our normal uh, path, but of something important to be uh, to learn more about. Yep. So we are going to be speaking with Matt Swish. He is the founder of Comey, an incident response startup uh, based in Dubai, which is where I met him. And I have to say he's he's definitely an expert on all of this. Uh, Matt, welcome to the show. Hi, Tracy. Hi, Joe. Uh, Thanks for inviting me. Uh, Looking forward to talking uh, with you about uh, what uh, cyber war might uh, look like. Yeah. So uh, you have a bit of expertise in this. I mean, not just from the hacking perspective, but uh, there are some Russian hackers who seem to be obsessed with you. Is that right? <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I assume you're uh, referring to uh, the, the group called the uh, Shadow Brokers that mentioned yeah. me like a few years back. Yeah. Uh, so just for background, uh, Matt and I met when I was working in Abu Dhabi and Dubai. And uh, this was back when shadow brokers um, had a major um, attack and there was a lot of talk about them. And they allegedly were a Russian group of hackers. And they seem to really, I don't know, just focus on you, Matt. Uh, Yeah. So I I guess like one of the main reasons for the uh, focus at the time was mainly due to the fact that uh, I was analyzing uh, a lot of the documents that they were releasing. To date, uh, that's one of the group that released some of the most significant uh, documents uh, in cybersecurity, like probably as significant as uh, the uh, Snowden document, to give some context for the audience. Mm. And as part of the release, they uh, release operational notes and uh, exploits uh, that belong to the U.S. government, uh, particularly to the uh, NSA, which is the... Uh, uh, main uh, intelligence agency uh, in the U.S. where they were exposing uh, U.S. intelligence capabilities. Uh, so those documents were released. I was part of the uh, main people who were like analyzing them, and uh, and like you may, like you said, you know, they've been mentioning me a few times so far. Like the 
main assumption is that that group is affiliated to the uh, Russian government. And like m- many times, you know, and we, I'm sure we're going to talk about it more in, uh, in details with cyber, it's very hard to know uh, who is doing what. Uh, mm. Sometimes it takes years uh, to find enough evidence. Uh, sometimes uh, governments uh, know about something, but they would not necessarily like release the information because they may burn uh, some source that they have to collect additional uh, intelligence. So it's always like mm. very complicated when it comes to cyber, uh, especially with attribution. So usually you have to use uh, common sense. Uh, but in terms of timing, uh, the shadow brokers were really active around 2016 and 2017, which is around the time where we started to see uh, a lot of attacks from R- Russia and Ukraine also. When you say attribution is difficult, I mean, intuitively, of course, it, that makes a lot of sense. What are the type of evidence or what do the certain like fingerprints? Because you hear that a lot. Oh, there's a hack and people suspect, often suspect Russians, sometimes Chinese. Are there certain characteristics of attacks or certain things you look at to start to sort of gauge the uh, the origin of an attacker? Uh, yeah, definitely. Like different attackers have different motives and different groups are uh, organized like differently. So when it comes to uh, here, when we are talking about hackers, we are talking about nation states. We're not talking about someone who is like alone in their bedroom yeah. uh, trying to hack a video game, right? So just to make sure it's clear for the audience, we are talking about nation states carrying uh, intelligence or military operations uh, against other like nation states or companies, sometimes critical uh, critical infrastructures. Uh, so when it comes down to what it looks like in terms of fingerprints when you're doing an uh, investigation, uh, it, it is a good question because uh, at the beginning in the introduction uh, chat, uh, you're wondering what uh, cyber war, cyber warfare uh, might look like. And there is this conception that people have that uh, cyber war is going to be like completely different, something we haven't seen before, that, you know, it's just going to be like in the medieval uh, time where you see like people riding a horse and instead of having swords, you know, they're going to have antennas and they're going to start stabbing <laughs> each other. And then you use that as forensic evidence. Uh, the reality is we have been uh, seeing a lot of those happening uh, over the past years, uh, probably more than 10 years, you know, like uh, even uh, uh, back in the uh, 2000s when uh, China hacked uh, Google, you know, that was a pretty uh, significant one. And that's, it was one of the first time we saw a nation state uh, attacking like uh, an actual company and being able to uh, track it. So w- what we have been uh, seeing more and more is often like patterns between attacks, but also like motives. Mm-hmm. So whenever it comes to attacks on critical infrastructure in, uh, let's say, like Ukraine, so there is a very short list of suspects that uh, comes to mind. Uh, same thing when there is an attack happening like NotPetya in 2017 that gets uh, that gets released on uh, the Independence Day. So often like the timing is very uh, suspicious. Same thing with uh, the article that you mentioned that you saw this morning, Tracy, uh, with uh, Viasat, which is an American uh, company. Uh, when the satellites uh, have been like uh, uh, attacked, uh, like the initial suspicion uh, back, so we're talking like back on February 24, uh, when uh, like around the same time of the invasion, one of the suspicion was, well, that's happening the same day that Russia is invading uh, Ukraine. So that was also one of the suspicion. So often you would use that common sense when it comes to nation state attackers, and then you would backtrack based on what you have found and see if your assumption makes sense or not. But it can be, you would find a malware uh, that's on the the system. And in some cases, like people kind of assume that once you are hacked, you know, like your screen is gonna change color, it's gonna become red or green. Most of the time, like cyber is uh, often used for like intelligence gathering. So you not even know that people are in your system. Uh, In some cases, it may take like years before an uh, attacker uh, is detected. So when you get hacked, uh, a face doesn't come up on your screen and start laughing. uh, (laughs) Exactly. And tell you that. Exactly. Okay. 
Thank you. So <laughs> now you know, Joe. Um, yeah. So <laughs> you mentioned, Matt, that this has been ongoing for some time. And this is something that I've wondered about for a long time. But why? I mean, it, if you know that Russia is doing a lot of hacking, I mean, along with some other countries like China, North Korea, maybe, but you know that mm -hmm. this is happening. Why mm -hmm. do nation states tolerate it? Like, why hasn't this mm. become a bigger area of concern for the U.S. in recent years? Or is it that it is a major area of concern, but we just don't see the response because it's all happening, you know, at the back end of technological systems and um, with the NSA and, you know, in sort of secret offices? Uh, it, it is a good question. Actually, uh, it is happening. Uh, if you go on the uh, like the State Department website, you're gonna find a lot of um, indictment uh, against, like, uh, like for instance, like uh, Russian officers that work for the uh, GRU or other like intelligence uh, agencies. So, for instance, like a lot of the attacks from uh, 2017. There is an indictment where six officers are being mentioned for a lot of the uh, damage that they have done, including like uh, the Olympic Games that have been, uh, you know, one of the targets, uh, including like the visitors, uh, the host of the Olympic Games, uh, one of the electricity grid uh, in Ukraine being in tar a target, also the election in France at that time uh, when the emails from Emmanuel Macron had been released. Mm. Uh, TV Five Mond also, which was uh, a TV channel that was uh, hacked in the past. You know, it was linked to uh, the uh, the Russian government. So the actual uh, proof and accusation have been like published. A lot of it is usually like policy work and uh, done done at a political level. So that would explain why it takes so much time and often. Uh, very little uh, can be done in a short period of time. And often what we would see in response would be uh, sanctions uh, on some of the governments. So it is happening, but I think it's happening at a pace where there are so many attacks uh, happening from different countries, like you mentioned, uh, like North Korea, for instance, that had been like... Uh, very active, uh, mostly for like financial gains. Like uh, we remember the attack of the Central Bank of Bangladesh, for instance, where they mm. try to steal like That's $1 right. billion. Dollars. Uh, and where money laundering like happened in casinos uh, in the Philippines. So like a lot of information is public and known around like modus operandi from like different like either groups uh, that are working independently or like semi independently like for like a nation state. Uh, but it's such a complex problem that it's very hard to fix a bit like conflict uh, all around the world. So a nightmare scenario in the US, but I guess, but anywhere is this idea of they're going to, uh, hackers could shut down critical infrastructure. Maybe the grid in New York City just goes dark because of some hack attack. Is that a realistic threat in your view? I mean, that I think comes to mind or we can't log into our banks or how like big pieces of infrastructure that could disrupt society. A, is that a plausible threat? And B, is that something that these types of hacker groups are could could conceivably work on? Uh, yeah, no, definitely. And uh, like I mentioned before, it happened in the past with the uh, Ukrainian like power grids. Uh, it happened like, you know, like in 2015 and 2016. At some point, the electricity like grid was uh, down for like a few hours. Hmm. Uh, but one of the things to keep in mind is like as those attacks have been happening over the past 10 years, uh, right. defense capabilities, you know, also uh, from like different companies and like countries, uh, also like uh, became more and more um, efficient because on one side you have the attackers that are like uh, uh, polishing their craft and becoming more efficient but also on the defense side people are becoming more aware of what type of attack to expect they are becoming more resilient like if something happens you know like if uh, any incident happens like how do you investigate it so that's 
what you would usually call like incident response, but also like auto recover, uh, like a system for, especially for like critical infrastructure. So regarding uh, targeting like a critical infrastructure. So we, we saw it like uh, around two weeks ago with the satellites. So with that company Viasat, so a mm -hmm. lot of the uh, uh, actual like users that have been targeted were like partly the Ukrainian uh, military. So that's uh, one of the attempt of like uh, interfering with the infrastructure for of uh, like the, the target to like kind of slow down or make communication like more difficult. But during that uh, that hack, you know, like uh, unexpectedly, like uh, there's like three thousand like wind uh, like wind uh, turbines in Germany that. Uh, were shut down, you know, as uh, like hmm. uh, like the German government was calling it uh, cyber collateral uh, damage, you know. Huh. Um, so sometimes it may come in unexpected ways, but in that scenario, uh, what it meant is the access internet uh, was not available anymore, but the actual like turbine, for instance, were not damaged. It's just the communication link, you know, it's like... Right. Uh, if someone would shut down like a cell phone tower, it would not damage your phone. You would just not be able to uh, communicate. And we saw that also at the beginning of the uh, invasion because there's also this very uh, weird aspect of the uh, Russian military since the beginning of the invasion. And that's kind of why a lot of people are a bit uh, uh, skeptical on the, the planning and the logistics of uh, the Russian military uh, on that aspect is mostly around communications. They are still uh, not necessarily like using like military equipment. Uh, they still use like analog communications, but also like uh, cell phones with like Russian numbers. So at some point, some of the uh, Ukrainian uh, telco operator rejected like Russian uh, numbers and they were mm -hmm. not able to communicate and they had to take over like cell phone of civilians just to be able to uh, still communicate with each other. But well, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, like communication aspect, obviously, when you uh, conduct like a, a military operation. So like, and that's a completely different field, you know, that's uh, not, not my specialty. Uh, but we do see it happening because cyber war on its own does not really like exist, you know, like cyber is a component of war. And that's what we're seeing now. So instead of seeing like a conventional uh, war, we see like this uh, hybrid uh, warfare happening in front of our eyes where like there's multiple aspects to it. And a lot of the actual attacks uh, that we have seen also with Russia and that Russia is uh, pretty well known for, and I'm sure as journalists, you are like very uh, like uh, familiar with it is also like disinformation and misinformation. Mm. Like we have seen uh, what they call like active measures uh, being used uh, for a long, long time. R Russia Today and Sputnik News have been like banned uh, in the EU now. Uh, so it took like the invasion, you know, of uh, an European country for them to shut down those media. So like to answer your question of before, like how come we don't see like more yeah. sanction or response from the governments? Well, that's a perfect example. Like we knew that was happening and it took the invasion of an European country for them to do something about it. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you, this is... It might be a tricky question. I don't know. But could you maybe walk us through a timeline of what actually happens if, say, a nation state like Russia hypothetically launches some sort, let's say, some sort of malware attack um, on uh, a Western company or infrastructure utility type thing? Like, what happens? So the attack starts. And then can you walk us through what the actual response looks like and when the attack stops? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I can even give you an example. So right. sure. in, uh, around Christmas 2020, there is a company called Solar Winds uh, that was targeted. Uh, I think it targeted around like 20,000 of their customers. So and uh, the uh, and you have to keep in mind. So, like, let's say if like you have twenty thousand, uh, uh, you know, customers, companies using the same software, and, and that was a massive problem. Uh, it means that all of them have been hacked. So, what happened is uh, what they did is what we call a supply chain attack. You know, where they managed to distribute a malicious update to all their customers. And whenever that update was uh, distributed to all their customers, that was their infection vector for all of those companies. And that was 
uh, probably like to date the largest uh, hack uh, of uh, foreign countries. That was a, a huge, um, huge scandal, obviously. Uh, like the White House uh, blamed the uh, SVR agencies, which is like the uh, foreign intelligence uh, agency of, uh, of Russia hmm. uh, for that attack. Uh, so in that case, uh, yeah, governments have been blaming, uh, blaming and pointing fingers to Russia. But out of that, we didn't see like much uh, coming out of it uh, in that case. And uh, in that scenario, it took one cybersecurity uh, company to uh, be a victim that uh, f- found out that they've been infected uh, by, by luck. And then more and more people started to investigate. And then they realized, oh, wow, like 18,000 uh, uh, customers from that company uh, have been uh, targeted and the malware was like spreading undetected. Are companies good at sharing cyber information with each other? Because it it is such a sensitive topic. And when you're under attack, on on the one hand, I imagine you don't necessarily want to broadcast it to the world. But on the other hand, you could argue that you have a responsibility um, to your customers, clearly, but also to other companies to flag a threat that is actually happening. Uh, Yeah, very good question, actually. Uh, so in the case of Solar Winds, uh, if uh, that uh, cybersecurity company that was a victim of the hack uh, didn't raise the alarm, saying "Oh, we found this. That's suspicious," you know, and then like people followed up and were like, "Oh, that's actual malware. Uh, we found it present in other places." Uh, people would not have been able to conclude that so many customers were targeted, and in that scenario, like uh, you're saying, like the information sharing was very beneficial. Uh, often for cybersecurity, so you have like few companies that are like the antivirus providers or uh, endpoint security uh, companies that have a lot of uh, visibility because of the telemetry they have on millions of machines. So for them, uh, it's pretty good to uh, and pretty easy to uh, see if something new like uh, happens, you know. Uh, in the case of uh, Microsoft now, which is probably like the, the biggest cybersecurity uh, company in the world, uh, ironically. They have very, very good telemetry. Before the invasion, so a wiper, uh, which is uh, a malware that's designed to erase uh, the the computer, uh, was detected. So a few different security vendors uh, managed to uh, detect it. Microsoft was one of them uh, because that really good telemetry, they were able to detect it within like a few hours. Uh, in that case, you know, like uh, what we notice so far when it comes to like uh, cyber is there is a huge focus on cyber before the war become actually uh, kinetic. So uh, either to destabilize the enemy or to uh, g- gather information. How often, you know, you mentioned and I, I remember that the solar winds hack that used a, uh, a patch update to distribute malware to uh, SolarWinds clients. How often are cybersecurity companies themselves the target of hackers? And uh, this, this, uh, you know, this technique of using a cybersecurity update patch to distribute malware. How common is that? And how, and just in general, how much are these companies themselves uh, the target of attacks? Uh, v- very good question. So, so they are. Uh, and often does it happen for like security companies to be like targets? Yeah, uh, it yeah. probably happens all the time uh, because of the assets uh, that they have. Either like toolings, like the tools, you know, or the uh, yeah. human resources they have, you know, that uh, could include uh, being targeted at conference or not. Uh, like I was t- like I was giving an example to. Uh, to, to Tracy. So for instance, I was supposed to give a keynote at a security conference in Russia uh, a few years ago before COVID. So one year before COVID. And uh, I got denied of entry uh, in Russia, so at the airport. Uh, so I was not able to deliver the, 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 the keynote at that conference. Uh, the official reason is because my visa was uh, not valid. Uh, mm-hmm. Although I told them, I was like, you are the one who shoot me the visa. What do you mean? It's not valid, you know? <laughs> and then I had to fly back on the next flight uh, b- back uh, to Dubai. So in that case, you know, like, uh, and often, you know, like there's always stories in security conferences where like security researchers, you know, like 
uh, are either like being followed or like someone like went into like their hotel room, you know. Uh, there is a bunch of like different stories like that. So when it comes to like how often like security companies or security researchers are being targets, uh, it happens a lot. It also happened like last year where like a bunch of security researchers were like uh, active targets uh, by uh, North Korean uh, hackers, mostly like to try to steal like uh, tools from them or if, if they had any exploits. Uh, so for the audience, uh, an exploit is what uh, like groups or nation states uh, can use to directly like uh, target a machine so they can get uh, unauthorized access to a machine. So usually they have, uh, if you have a security vulnerability in a software and you have the software that can take advantage of it, that's what we call an exploit. You have different categories of them, including what we call like a zero day exploit that even uh, software providers are not aware of. So that could be like Microsoft, Apple, and in some cases it may even uh, not even require like any user interaction to be uh, enabled. And in the case of the uh, nation state uh, type of hacking, because that requires a lot of uh, R&D, it is very expensive. Some of those exploits like go for sale on the uh, like gray market for like millions of dollars. And also like it's very complicated to do because unlike traditional weapons, that's not something that you can replicate. Each security vulnerability bug is going to be different. And it requires a specific set of uh, skill set to be able to find and write an exploit. So in the case of uh, a full-on like cyber war, uh, yeah. a lot of people were kind of expecting uh, countries to stop to use like exploit like left and right at each other. But to go back to your other question, uh, it's something that's very difficult to measure because there's no like proper uh, unit of measures for like often it happens that's only like when you know it happens it's only a small subset of the information that you have mm. uh, sometimes like uh what's happening over the past two weeks and uh, over the next months uh i'm pretty sure we're still gonna be analyzing it uh like you know in three four years um like some of the tools that have been released by the uh, shadow brokers uh, a lot of the exploits were like four or five years old in that case and when they got released, you know, it was, uh, you know, like a pretty, it got a lot of attention. Some of them have been even like repurposed into some new malwares, including Notpetya, which was targeting uh, Ukraine at the time. Hmm. Um, so it's very difficult to have, uh, yeah, pretty ironic. Huh? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's pretty difficult to have like data on those things. And keep in mind, like, uh, like you said before, when you get hacked, you know, you don't get like, some face like showing up on your screen and some uh, guy laughing, but it, it is very important to uh, to highlight actually because cyber is mostly used for intelligence. So you want to know uh, what your target is doing, unless you just want to steal money. You know that's a completely different category of a cyber attack. So like you have a clear goal. You know you're like oh, okay, money is gone now, or like if a crypto exchange is being hacked or a Swift uh, service bureau is being hacked. Uh, but most of the time, it is for intelligence. And whenever you have access somewhere, you want to make sure you keep your access. So whatever door you use uh, to enter the machines you, um, that you have been targeting and where you are like uh, feeling from in terms of intelligence, you don't want to lose that access. And that's also one of the big, big suspicion. Like there is cyber, uh, there are cyber attacks happening now uh probably on both sides but we don't necessarily see them in uh, january there is a uh, a belarusian group called uh, the uh, cyber partisan uh, i don't know if you have heard about them no. but they are very organized like they're all like independent uh all anonymous decentralized uh around like 20 to 30 people but what they did back in january when they started to see that Russia started to ship military equipment from Bela, uh, Belarus, uh, they started to target the uh, railway system of Belarus. And this is pretty interesting and very uh, important uh, to notice because so far when you hear about like independent groups, you know, kind of like related, uh, like counterattacking, 
or doing something is mostly like shutting down a website, changing a website. But here you have an independent group that actually uh, managed to create a dent into like uh, a big enemy to affect uh, their logistics. So by slowing down, uh, well, by shutting down the railway system, they were able to huh. slow down the uh, transportation of military equipment. And the second objective, uh, which is like suspected, is also to create a doubt with uh, the enemy, in that case, uh, with Russia, uh, with the uh, leadership. So to show that the uh, Belarusian uh, allies was not were not necessarily like that reliable huh. but also uh on their side once they realized that uh it actually had been hacked to create a doubt saying well if their railway system have been hacked what makes our own railway system like immune to such an attack so they would spend like additional like few days or weeks uh, investigating their own uh, infrastructure uh, postponing uh, like the transportation of military equipment and uh, assets. That's interesting. Um, I want to ask more about retaliatory um, hacking, but before we do, I just want to go back to something you said about exploits. How is there a marketplace for exploits? Like, how are these things actually sold or, or dealt? I just have this vision in my head of like a guy with a briefcase in a hotel room opening it up, and there's like different exploits in the briefcase, but obviously it wouldn't happen like that. Uh, it depends, you know, like uh, if Nicolas Cage was like selling exploits, you know, I'm sure it would like this. Uh, <laughs> but in, in some cases, you have to keep in mind that uh, some of the transactions don't necessarily want to be like traced. Right. Uh, so using cash actually would make sense. Uh, using payment over like cryptocurrency uh, would make sense. Uh, using wire transfer like would make sense as long as there is a transaction uh, for something you know like everything you can imagine does make sense right uh, so like that uh, image you have in mind uh, I'm sure it happened in in some scenarios uh, but regarding like outside of what a transaction might look like what the marketplace may look like obviously it's not like a a Fiverr or like a Facebook marketplace where like you're just selecting what you want. <laughs> uh, so you have uh, companies that are brokers uh, doing this. Uh, some of them, you know, like are quite public in the US or in Australia. Uh, usually they would work with their own government. In the case of uh, each government is going to have different uh, stories. Like in the case of, for instance, like China, uh, like there's a um, uh, a competition that was organized like a few years back called the Tian Fu Cup, where um, as part of the competition, they were saying, okay, like if security researchers like find a bug, you know, like uh, we're going to report it to vendors, etc. Uh, but one of the exploits was actually linked to another exploit, very similar, that was used uh, against the uh, Uyghurs. Uh, so Regarding like all people buy exploits, you know, like there is a demand that's higher than the supply in that scenario. So most of the time, and the buyers are always the same, you know, it's going to be like governments, like either like NATO members or like, you know, like China, like, uh, or like uh, R Russia, et cetera. So most of the main governments uh, would just like buy those exploits. I'm sure they also have some researchers like internally uh finding their own bugs and writing their own exploits um but yeah like you have a bunch of brokers uh like uh, in different countries so I don't want to get sidetracked on this too much, but I do want to ask one question because you mentioned the use of crypto for mm. payments. And of course, there seem, you know, the two sides of this question take out very maximalist viewpoints. I don't really trust either. So you have government saying oh, crypto is just used for uh, money laundering and crime and stuff like that. And that seems to be an exaggeration to say the least. And then you have the sort of 
crypto defenders who go to the extreme and say, no, it, it is, crypto is terrible for any of this stuff because you can all see it on the blockchain. And so don't point mm-hmm. finger at, at us. As someone who is sort of watching this, where do you come on this question and how do people in the hacker community think about the uh, advantages or disadvantages of using crypto for transactions? Uh, well, it, it depends for what. Uh, in the case of uh, ransomware, which is uh, a malware that's going to infect machines, uh, encrypt files, and ask for like a ransom uh, in exchange of decrypting the files, usually those transactions are happening, uh, happening over crypto. Uh, like in that specific scenario for ransomware, like crypto uh, currencies literally like created a whole like new market uh, for like uh, criminal hackers. Uh, so, like, because otherwise, like, if crypto was not around, you know, like, you not see like ransomware, you know, you couldn't just right. you could not ask for a payment over wire transfer or, uh, you know, like over PayPal. Although, like, in some attacks, you know, for like phishing emails, you know, when they change invoices, you know, they put a fake bank account, you, yeah. you st- it still end up doing like a, a wire transfer and large amount of money are being transferred. But if that would be the case, you know, for law enforcement, it's much easier to actually like trace. Uh, who is behind it and to find, okay, like that attacker was there. Those are like the people who opened the account, okay, there are mules, and then to like trace back uh, efficiently. Um, regarding like, uh, yeah, cryptocurrency in the context of uh, Ukraine and Russia, like there is very, uh, like there's a bunch of inter- interesting things happening. Uh, for instance, like the uh, money that the uh, Ukrainian government has been raising over crypto. Right. Like a bunch of like uh, like the founder of Ethereum donated, the founder of like Solana donated, the founder of Polkadot donated, and they managed to like uh, buy equipment with it and invest, etc. Uh, they're also talking about launching their own NFT campaign, you know, like in exchange for like people, etc. So they are like uh, y- using like crypto in a way uh, that makes sense for like financial transactions. Uh, but uh, my personal opinion also, it's also like what we are witnessing is obviously there is an actual like conventional war where people are being killed uh, in 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 that sense, but. On the other side, uh, Ukraine has been uh, doing very well in terms of like fighting uh, disinformation, which is like uh, like widely used by the Russian government. Like when they are sp- uh, spreading fake news about like you know, Ukrainian soldiers uh, like uh, being defeated, to kind of like reducing like the morale of the troops. Uh, instead, what we see is. Ukraine uh, promoting like news of like oh like look at those farmers have been stealing a tank with their tractor and they are sharing videos that like, are going viral and we see them oh we're using crypto to raise money like hey uh, people from the internet like we need your support oh we're also gonna do an NFT you know like uh, support Ukraine NFT so it, I think it's also part of the response to Russian attacks but not only from like the actual like cyber attack point of view, but also like from a disinformation point of view, because if you keep the news like positive around it and people engage, people on your side, uh, while uh, sanctions are happening on your enemy, that's very efficient. And I think that's like the way where U- Ukraine has been very innovative in how to use uh, crypto since the uh, beginning of uh, the invasion. Um, I want to go back to... Russia and Ukraine specifically. So, you know, you mentioned the one group um, and its attacks on Belarusian railways. What are the options for retaliation from, um, you know, either the West or from independent groups who want to create trouble for Russia? Uh, well, in the case of like what's happening with Yasat, so we have the German government saying, okay, like, we, we think uh, we're, we've been victim of uh, cyber collateral damage uh, from the conflict. So they recognize they've been a victim uh, from that. Uh, I guess we're going to see like the response to it re- regarding that. I'm sure uh, a lot of NATO uh, ca- uh, countries are also like uh, relating uh, in private, uh, not necessarily like communicating about it. 
uh, that's what I was saying. A lot of the things we're probably gonna like see more, you know, like uh, in in few years actually. And uh, actually, I'm glad that pod- podcast is happening like few weeks after the invasion because it get, also gave us some time to kind of watch what was happening instead of just speculating of like, okay, are we gonna go in full on like cyber war? Are like all the countries, you know, in Europe gonna have like uh, their electricity being shut down for like days? You know, uh, so far that's not the case. And uh, regarding uh, the response from the governments, so there there are like few aspects uh, to it. I think a lot of um, governments so far uh, are also realizing that they have been overestimating the capabilities of Russia. Uh, And that's not necessarily like only from a cyber point of view, because like I was saying at the beginning, there is... uh, what we can see now is like the poor planning and the logistics uh, since the beginning of the invasion from Russia. In terms of cyber, yes, more can be done uh, from both sides. But like I was saying, most of it is uh, for intelligence. At the beginning, of, for instance, the um, satellites uh, that were hacked, you know, was mostly to uh, disrupt uh, the military infrastructure. But as we see now, like two weeks later, the military military infrastructure of Ukraine is still like uh, functioning like uh, pretty efficiently. So if they could have done it, they probably would have done it by now instead of just like dragging the you know like in the conflict like longer. Uh, but yeah, in terms of response from like NATO and uh, in general uh, for like cyber attacks, you know, I think we're gonna see a lot of like policy. Uh, being uh, changed, you know, over like the next months, you know, probably like new bills being passed, you know, uh, not that it's becoming uh, uh, one of the priority for governments and there are probably some cases, you know, that didn't listen to uh, before, but I would not expect much uh, in terms of like traditional response. Like, you know, I think it's just like response in the sense of like, okay, there is a war happening, potentially like a world war, like, are we going to respond? And it's probably going to be like more sanctions, like what we are witnessing now. Those are like part of the uh, actual response. Uh, and it also implies, you know, like if they obviously like hack uh, NATO uh, governments. So that may be like, uh, like we have seen like uh, Russia being disconnected from SWIFT. Then some tech companies, you know, like, um, like uh, Apple or Microsoft not selling their softwares anymore. Uh, at the moment, it's still unclear. If software updates are still gonna be like deployed uh, in in Russia, because if they are not uh, deployed, it means they will not have access to uh, security updates. Also, so so far they're just talking about like payments and selling. Uh, so like Steam, you know, like a video game company was like that. Microsoft, uh, Apple, you know, like uh, like uh, stop providing access to the uh, App Store. Um, but those are like the response we are seeing so far, like SWIFT, uh, mostly like sanctions, either by governments or like uh, major tech companies. You know, we talk about uh, Russian hacking teams, you mentioned North Korea, China. Is it safe to assume that anything that's being done by those countries that U.S. and NATO governments have the equivalent teams and capabilities? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean... Uh, one of the big releases from these uh, shadow brokers was to show the uh, capabilities of the U.S. government, uh, and some of that was also like including, you know, like uh, targets uh, from uh, the uh, U.S. government. Uh, same thing when Snowden uh, released some of the documents. Right. We also saw some of the targets uh, from the U.S. government, including European like telco uh, companies, uh, although they are allies, they are not enemies. Spies uh, are just continuing uh, to spy, you know, it's just like <laughs> spying stuff everywhere. So that that actually is, leads to one, a question that's been on the back of my mind, this whole conversation. The spies are always going to be spies. Is it worth thinking of cyber warfare as a sort of discrete um, event? And so, of course, when we think of conventional warfare, there's often a start. There's an invasion. Maybe there's a ceasefire. Hopefully at some point soon uh the war ends is is cyber warfare an event or is it just a is it an occurring sort of ongoing persistent element of the interaction between uh nations these days that doesn't have any sort of like start or end 
Uh, I would I would say it's a component of wall. So that's why at the beginning I was talking about like hybrid wall versus like uh, conventional yeah. wall, and uh, mostly it is used uh, here for intelligence uh, gathering, so to collect information right. on troops, enemies, capabilities. Uh, it may be used for disruption, uh, like we've seen with the satellite, uh, yeah. like a few weeks ago, uh, or with the cyber partisan in January. But in that case, working as an independent independent group, because they, their goal is like to protect the uh, Belarusian uh, the, the democracy. Uh, so it may have some tra- strategic ob- objectives, uh, like in the case of like. Uh, the railway system in uh, in Belarus, uh, but it may also just be like uh, intelligence. And I think here it is mostly used for intelligence. For disruption, it does not make that much sense once you uh, enter in a kinetic mode, because if you can just, if you have soldiers like physically present uh, in the country, you can just shut down like cell phone towers. Uh, you can engage in electronic warfare, uh, you can start jamming, uh, you know, like um, whatever, like ways of communication there is. So you don't necessarily need to use like uh, cyber. Um, cyber makes sense before uh, the kinetic like war happening because you're going to collect information. You may do some light disruption, but at some point, like once uh, the war is starting, you it becomes more of a conventional war where, well, you need the winner and a loser, or you need an agreement, or you have like a ceasefire, um, and then cyber, just like, uh, you know, kind of like this background element, uh, depending if you include, you know, like disinformation, propaganda, and misinformation as part of cyber or not. Because as we can see now on social media, uh, a bit like when the Arab Spring uh, was happening, when a lot of people were like uh, sharing information on Twitter. Uh, now we can see people sharing a lot of information on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, around the war, you know, like the donation, like the stories, you know, like the stories, like I was saying about the tanks yeah. uh, being stolen and being shared, going viral. Uh, that's part of the uh, information warfare. And that's a very new uh, component because like things like TikTok, et cetera, didn't use uh, in the past and now the having uh, also like their role uh, within this uh, information warfare. Does that mean that those of us sitting in the US or Europe, we don't need to be worrying about, you know, an attack on critical infrastructure that suddenly um, takes away our electricity or empties out our Mm -hmm. bank accounts or something like that? Uh, Yeah, no, I would not be worried about it. Uh, And even if it would happen, you know, I'm sure like, you know, electricity would be done for like a very short period of time because there's process in place. An audio recover like uh, system, just like if something is faulty, uh, especially for like critical infrastructure. So I, I would not really worry. Um, one of the big story we're getting like critical infrastructure was like the uh, Stuxnet story, uh, mm-hmm. which is more than ten years old now. Uh, right. Back in Iran, when that uh, joint operation between Israel and the US was targeting one of the nuclear central, uh, they kind of just stopped it. And then back then, you know, like. Some movies like came out, uh, what's the name with uh, Chris Sandsworth, uh, Black Hat, you know, where like this, this nuclear central that's exploding at the end, etc. That's like the Hollywood <laughs> version. Uh, but in reality, okay, like it's down, you know, like what are the guys doing, you know, because they already have like process in place. And if you are like the, uh, the US or Europe, you know, like you definitely like plan for like uh, faulty issues, regardless if it's like cyber or something that's not working anymore. Uh, but yeah. In, in terms of like money being drained from your account, although uh, you won't have your money like being drained directly, um, but you know, like how low like stock markets are gonna go down now, or is it gonna affect like you know like the inflation? Uh, like we can see it with the ruble now, like it's completely crashing. So technically, money is not running out of your account, but you know you can do less with your money, or like your <laughs> no, like whatever you have is less valuable, you know. So. I think that's kind of like one of the side consequences that we would see. Last question for me is, uh, what is the skill set of a good hacker? And thinking about, okay, if you're Russia or any government, you're recruiting. What do you look for? What what make what makes a good hacker? Uh, 
Well, I just want to clarify. I'm I'm not recruiting like hackers for the Russian government, you know, <laughs> because sure, of, the way of you course, of the course, question, of course. You know? <laughs> well, what would they be looking for, or what would any government be looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. or like, or like, or like private companies, you no, know, yeah, because actually Pri- most or private of like companies, uh, yeah. m- most of really good like security researchers I know are just like either independent or working for like tech companies, yeah, uh, because they tend to pay like the best. You work on building cool technologies. And yeah, usually if people are like really good, just like end up doing a lot of research. So you want to work with the very, very best. And you know, it's such right. a, it's a field that's moving like so fast that at the end of the day, you know, like you, you, you need to like surround yourself with the best. Otherwise, like you won't learn like everything. Right. So I don't know if there is like, you know, like the, uh, there is no like equivalent of like Wall Street bet for like hackers per se, you know, where like mm-hmm. people are just like sharing like random information around uh, but in terms of skill set, you know, like I keep reminding people that uh, hacking or being a hacker is a skill set first. You know, it's not an ethical or political position that comes uh-huh. like secondary. Uh, it's like if you're a lawyer, you know, like you don't ask him if he's like ethical or unethical. And we have seen in the past with like Panama mm-hmm. Papers and all those things, you know, like you could ask the question as well for like lawyers. But yeah, most of like good security researchers or hackers, you know, um, they all have different background, different skill sets, because it can go from physical security to radio frequency to like software security, uh, hardware security, firmware security, like uh, open source intelligence. You know, we see more and more people, uh, even like groups, you know, like uh, Bellingcat, you know, like that, that yeah. been tracking a lot of the uh, military activity, you know, uh, from... Uh, online resources, you know, like on the different groups uh, that's, you know, like those are like all like different fields uh, that come from like uh, information security. Um, so, I mean, like, yeah, everyone who is curious, you know, and like uh, likes to put the time into the research is a, is a, yeah, is a good hacker. You know, I've seen like journalists who are like really good at doing their research, you know, etc. They're like, sometimes I have more knowledge and more skills than uh, some of actual professionals. So it's really something that's very uh, across like uh, multiple disciplines. Mm. Uh, well, Matt, I think that's a good place to leave it. Thank you so much for coming on Odd Lots and spending time with us to explain uh, hacking and what it could actually look like in those contexts. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, Joe, I really enjoyed that conversation. I don't think we talked about it, but the shadow brokers actually called Matt a, a fun guy at one point. Um, and he is a very fun <laughs> guy. Like He's fun really guy. good at explaining some of the more technical aspects of this. But I thought his framing of cyber as a component yeah. of conventional warfare, I mean, that seems right, at, at least so far, like given what we've seen so far. I think that's right, or two, or let's put it this way. I think I, I found that to be really helpful because when I think of, you know, when you think of cyber attacks, I think we often have these very uh, dramatic visions of some big grid being taken down. And obviously that's possible. And you mentioned examples. And you mentioned the mm-hmm. example of the Belarusian railway, or the uh, Ukrainian grid. But that more, the more common impulse is uh, intelligence gathering. And that's, yeah. that's the big thing, collecting data is sort of a, a useful way of thinking uh, thinking about its role. Yeah, and the other thing that it sort of coalesced for me was the idea of a lot of governments have been tolerating these attacks for a long time, um, and this seems like a crunch point, at least when it yeah. comes to Russia, right? Like, I, I was reading, uh, Goldman Sachs put out a note right before uh, we came on to record this, talking about cyber warfare. And they had a stat in there, something like 60% of state-sponsored cyber attacks are thought to have come from Russia, which seems extreme. But for some reason, no one really did anything about it. Yes, there were some sanctions in place, but now we've seen um, you know, a very dramatic form of sanctions rolled out. And it seems doubtful that that kind of behavior is going to be tolerated going forward. Yeah. And but on the other hand, it's so nebulous. It's so difficult to know yeah. what you're going to do about it. And the point, you know, as, as Matt was saying, attacks that are happening right now, of which they're certainly going on, 
we'll be talking about in three or four years, perhaps. Mm-hmm. So when we learn about them and how how difficult it is to know often when you're being hacked or what the scope of the damage is, that in in that element, very different. I think he used the word, uh, you know, maybe I don't know if he used the word metrics, but this idea we have metrics to measure the devastation of conventional mm. war- warfare. We don't have, and it seems very implausible that we would have anytime soon, sort of equivalent metrics for cyber warfare. Yeah, it seems like it. All right, uh, well, shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. All right, this has been another episode of the All Thoughts Podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. This episode was produced by Magnus Henriksen, who is smartly not on Twitter. Uh, Follow the Bloomberg head of podcast, Francesca Levy, at Francesca Today. And check out all of our podcasts at Bloomberg under the handle at podcasts. Thanks for listening.